Okay, so I'm here uh, on behalf of uh, Associate Professor Anne Reid, um, just to do a very quick handball to, first of all, introduce the first in a series of two um, lectures or presentations called Documenting and Assessing Our Students' Learning in the Age of Evidence, presented by T. Laplack, the, that is, the Teacher Education, Language Arts and Professional Learning Academic Community. Over to you, Libby. Thank you very much, Graeme, and delighted that so many colleagues are able to join us today. This is a really interesting aspect of our work, and it's not new. We've always been interested in thinking about how do we know that our students are learning? How do we think about the ways in which we can know that the learning intentions we set are actually achieved through the practice that we develop with our students? We know that it's now a TMAG agenda, it's an AITSL agenda, that the public and the media are at the throats of the teacher educators. We know that under better teaching, better learning here in this university, we're thinking about assessment, we're thinking about time, we're thinking about space, and uh, many colleagues I know are going to be presenting in a big better teaching, better learning agenda forum coming up shortly. But as a, an academic community, what we're trying to do is problematise this area, to think about our work and to share our understandings. So what we're doing today is exploring some of the pedagogical and philosophical challenges associated with this kind of agenda that in lots of ways is being foisted upon us under the agenda of compliance. And secondly, we want to provide a little brief context of the policies, but not get bogged down in that, because that's something you can go away and read, 118 page documents called Classroom Ready, for example. So we don't want to get bogged down in the policies, we want to, we want to be deeply thinking about our practice. So, my colleagues, I'd like to introduce Helen Grimmett. My name's Libby Tudball, for those who don't know me. My colleague, Helen Grimmett. My colleague, Rachel Forgase. And my colleague, Anna Filippi, spelt with one P, not two. And many of the other academic community members who are here to discuss these things with us um, will engage in a dialogue with you about this work. And we want to unpack how these practices respond and I love Graham's term, push our thinking or speak back to some of the agendas that can be interpreted as quite controlling, rather than allowing for innovation and for reflection on our work that means that change happens for the good of better practice, rather than ticking a box on some list of standards that's imposed on us in quite a generic way. It's a complex terrain that we're working in. So I had a little bit of a think about, well, what do I think evidence is? What is this thing called evidence? It could be facts that I see in front of me or information, meaning that I know that we're achieving our learning goals and our attentions and that my beliefs that I hold about what I'm trying to get my students to understand and learn is actually valid and that I can speak that to myself and know that in my practice I'm actually making a difference. And it's also what we provide in accreditation documents. This is one of our biggest drivers, really, in what we have to provide to be accredited with the programs that we teach. But it's, it's deeper than that. It's what we notice about our students. It's what we see when they're working with us in classes. It's what we read in their work. It's what we hear in their conversations. And we capture this in complex ways, formatively, as learning and for learning and in complex summative ways as well of learning through the sort of structured tasks that we develop for our learners. Evidence can confirm for us what we're, our learning intentions are. It can verify the thinking that sits behind what we do. It can help us to document that and even prove that we are achieving what we try to set out to do. And it's leading to some programs that some of us have actually pushed back against. Example, personal literacy and numeracy testing. It's worrying me already that students are getting anxious about this one-off test that is costing them $185 every time they sit it. These are some of the agendas that we are uh, having to respond to. Now, it's not wanting to go, so we'll see. So, 
This whole evidence aspect of our work is now being pushed in very new directions by the AITSIL agendas. And very quickly, I'm not going to read this slide. This will be available for you to look at. I'm happy to send a copy. This dates back to 2014 when the current government was uh, set up the Teacher Education Ministerial Advisory Group to actually look at what was going on in teacher education. And so the February 2016 document called Guidance for the Accreditation is issuing us with very new challenges as teacher educators. So that we have to have elements requiring verification. Um, it's a requirement for graduation. It's got to be moderated. It's got to show that our students meet the Australian professional standards for teachers and so on. So in summary, we have an evidence agenda where the AITSL program standards, the Australian professional standards for teachers, are requiring two different kinds of evidence. One from within our program that we send into the VIT here in Victoria, and the other, this is the scary bit that we haven't even really got our heads around yet, is evidence of graduate outcomes and information that we collect on completion of the program. And so that's all I want to say at the moment as, as, a, as, a, as a preface to the work that our colleagues in our group are already doing in terms of looking at evidence, looking at questioning and looking carefully at our work. Over to you, Helen. Okay. In God we trust, all others must bring data. So <laughs> I think I'm at the very beginning of this um, journey of thinking about data and evidence and um, I find the whole thing quite daunting and scary, the whole idea of evidence and you know collecting your paper bags and taping it up and all of that. So my presentation is not really a presentation as such, I'm just going to throw open some of the questions that I've been thinking about, um, hopefully provoke some of your thinking, are you thinking similar things to me? Are we all just being scaredy cats together? Because basically it makes me feel like doing this, hiding my head in the sand. <laughs> so um, I suppose, you know, when we talk about data and especially the, the stuff about collecting evidence of graduate outcomes and, you know, the impact that our um, current students have in the future on, you know, on their students, it seems to me is all too hard and surely we can't possibly do this. But, what really brought home to me um, was when Marilyn Cochran Smith was out earlier in the year and we sat around this table and she was talking about the path that the US have gone and she said, I can't remember the time frame that she was using, but she said, you know, when this was first mooted in the, the US, was it 10 years ago or whatever, that she thought, well, they can't possibly do that. You know, you can't, there's too many variables, How could, no one could possibly measure. And so we didn't really engage with the conversation. But she said, you know, in hindsight, she wishes they had because someone always pops their head up and says, yeah, I can make a test for that or I can, you know, create some program that will um, show what students are learning and impact and someone, you know, pops up with something that then they're stuck with using. And she said, in hindsight, I wish we had engaged in the conversation and I suppose she was giving us a warning that if this is the conversation that's starting to happen now, get on board and, and have it. So I'm attempting to pull my head out of the sand, sand but it's at the moment I'm still just grappling with lots of That's questions. Oh, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Clip art is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so I'm just warning you, I have no answers. The other two can give some examples perhaps, oh, but um, I, I am absolving myself of all responsibility. I have no answers, just lots of questions. So a bit of background, I mostly teach in the arts subjects and mostly in um, art subjects that are uh, designed for who will be generalist primary teachers. So in the early years primary program and in the primary secondary program, but the arts subjects in particular are, are aimed at meeting that criteria of their course that enables them to be generalist primary school teachers. So in this subject, we're dealing with all forms of the arts, so dance, drama, visual arts, music, and also media arts in the Australian curriculum. And the Victorian curriculum now also has added visual communication in there, just to throw in an extra one, but much to my relief the other day, discovered that it was um, from secondary school upwards, so I can choose to ignore that for a little bit longer. Um, 
So there's an awful lot to cover. This is often their only arts unit they have in their course. And they usually arrive saying, oh, I, I don't sing and I can't draw and um, I won't really matter because I'll be in a school that'll have an art teacher and a music specialist and all of that as well. So the, just to give you a bit of an idea of what the um, outcomes from the handbook are, they're around things like develop an understanding, demonstrate skills, demonstrate an understanding, display an understanding, show an understanding. And they're all quite sort of skill-based, but you know, how do we cover all of that in a 12-week semester? Take out three weeks for placement, we've really only got nine weeks, no one shows up in the last week because they're busy doing their assignment. You know, it's an awful lot to cover. What, what can I really do? How can I actually meet all of these outcomes? So that's in the early years primary one. In the sec primary secondary one, again, develop a critical understanding, understand, implement and reflect. Develop an awareness of disciplinary skills and concepts in the arts. Remember all five arts. Develop skills in content selection and curriculum design in the arts. Engage with arts practices and experiences. But what I really want to do, what my real goal for them is to come in and realise that art is important for children and, um, and that there is a place in the generalist primary classroom for art, regardless of whether they think they're an art person or not. Mm -hmm. So first they need to realise that art is important for children, but then the really big step is making them believe that it's important for them too and for their teaching and um, for them as a teacher, but also for teaching not just the arts curriculum, but oh, there's, this is what they say, but I'm not an artist, you know, I can't do it, I don't need to engage with it, I won't be doing it anyway. So it's a lot of talking about, but yes, you will, and we can, because the arts can infuse so much into the general curriculum in all subject areas. So if I can, in this unit, get them thinking of, ah, oh, actually, yes, there is a place for the arts in the primary classroom, then I, I feel like I've done something. It's not what's in the, the printed outcomes. I still have to be ticking off those boxes as well, but what really matters? So often they come in feeling like this, with a low ability, I can't do it, and a low willingness, I won't do it. And we have to try and get them towards this. And often it's about um, reminding them that yes, they can do it. They were artists as children and you know, and often through secondary schooling as well, and then they've got busy and they've, they've you know, lost touch with it. So, so it's about confronting their ideas that, no, I can't and no, I won't, and inspiring them that, oh, yes, maybe there is something in, for the, in it for me. Coaching, um, you know, helping them build up some competence as well. But we also obviously have some students that come in who do have um, real skills in music or visual art or, you know, especially in the primary, secondary, that may be their, their chosen discipline. So how do I keep them engaged as well? So it's challenging. So here are some of my questions. What are my real goals for students learning in a creative arts unit for future generalist teachers? And how well are these aligned with the prescribed unit outcomes? You know, we say we're doing one thing, but actually, shh, my real goal is something that a bit different and we're also dealing with this idea that what gets measured gets done so if our assessments you know what we put in an assessment is what students will focus all their energy on but also in terms of um, for us you know what we have to provide as evidence is what we then focus our teaching on as well how do we not lose the the balance what are our current assessments actually capturing? How much do these things matter if students don't come away with a belief or intention to include arts in their future classrooms? Mm -hmm. So, you know, they can pull stuff off the internet and they can pull stuff out of their textbooks that, you know, talk about the arts concepts and whatever, but if they still don't have any intention of actually teaching it when they're out there, is there really any point except to tick off, we've done the arts unit, mm -hmm. the accreditation ticks off, we've you know, they've covered no arts. No content and how to teach it. That's right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But if you're not going to, does it matter? Are these things that really matter to me things that can be assessed and or documented? 
how do we assess and document these intangible attitudes and beliefs and mindsets? Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you get an, an email from a student that says, oh, I came into this unit really nervous, but, you know, you've really, you know, convinced me that, you know, I can, can do it, so that's great. But on a large scale, how can we actually assess mm -hmm. that? I don't, I don't, I have no answers, I'm wearing the T-shirt, so. I'm always, uh, Picasso says, I'm always doing that which I cannot do in order that I may learn how to do it. Or in this case, really in this unit, it's, I'm always doing that which I think I cannot do. We you know, try to get them engaged in lots of arts activities and remind them that, yeah, they can sing and they can, you know, draw something and whatever in order that they gain the confidence and, and learn some skills along the way to do it, how to do it. But then do our assessments then encourage risk taking for maximum learning rather than playing safe for maximum mm. marks? And I think actually in those two units I'm talking about, our assessments do encourage risk taking. They have to engage in their own arts making. And I have students in tears at the start of semester. I can't do it and I don't know what to do. And you know, it's really broad and open-ended and they really, really struggle with that. Just tell me exactly what I have to do and I have to really resist that. Um, but, you know, a lot of them are wanting to play safe for maximum marks. You know, they feel really uncomfortable about it and we talk a lot about wobble and it's the importance of doing that. And can we keep doing this in the age of evidence? If, you know, evidence is going to become more and more important, how do we keep our assessments really broad so that we're encouraging risk taking rather than doing the right thing? And how do we make sure that the stuff we measure is the stuff that actually matters, not just the stuff that is easily <laughs> measured, I think is the big question that everyone asking. How do we make sure that what's driving our curriculum is, you know, sits well with our values rather than just resorts to this is what I can measure? So as I said, I've got no answers, just lots of questions. And um, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Helen, for that. And what we thought we would do is just give you a moment to turn to your partner next to you and say, "Are some of these concerns, issues, concepts, questions mm -hmm. striking a chord with you?" Just chat for a minute. We'll give you a little time to think and reflect. Okay, okay folks. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's bring you back. And hopefully that's given you a chance to think about this from your own perspective. Now I'm going to hand over to Anna Filippi, who's coming at this from another direction. Mm. Thank good. you, Anna. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Very artistic. Mine's going to be a little bit more verbal, <laughs> I suppose, in keeping with language. Um, just before I start, I do want to thank um, and, and acknowledge Dat's input in this. We, this is a unit that, that I'm going to be talking about, and this assessment task in particular is one that I share with Dat, and so we've been developing it and working together um, in this unit for quite a long time, and so there have been lots of changes, so I wanted to just acknowledge um, his involvement in this. This was a really interesting exercise, just thinking about the assessment task. When you start to really put it together and to write it and to think about it, all sorts of questions come at you. And then you start thinking, mm, how do I actually put this together? What do I use as my own documentation for what I'm doing? Um, and all sorts of questions. And I think it's really valuable for all of us to take this time out and do it and to really think about these assessment tasks. We just don't give ourselves time. We're not very kind to ourselves in terms of really thinking about what we do, why we do it, how we do it, and what we want to get out of a particular task. So my presentation is really going to be about some of the tensions. I want to really talk about, or at least raise questions around the tensions between what is imposed on us and our own practice and what happens at the coalface. And really in so, so many ways when I think about this, it's really come to the fore for me this year, is the sense that not everybody really understands what you do. I don't really understand what I do myself. So I think, you know, in some ways, that's a really important part of it. So I want to look at what makes this notion of quality assessment, quality feedback, and how that becomes, how there, are t there is a tension between that and what is practical, what is achievable, given the resources that we have. So that's really my journey for this particular very short presentation. 
So I'm just going to very quickly, because I don't have very much time, um, tell you what, what the assessment task is. So the, the unit is Master of TESOL. Um, it's the final unit, and I'll, I'll go through that in a minute. And it's a professional practice for teachers of TESOL. This is a very challenging unit or very challenging course in general because I don't think it's really quite well understood that when we talk about TESOL, we talk about very different kinds of teaching English language. We have English as an international language. We have English as a second language. We have English for refugees in the, as an additional language. And we try and bring all of that together. And so we have a very large cohort of international students who do come here to become teachers. And we forget that because, of course, that's not what the Master of TESOL or Master of Education is about. And so there's another tension that we really need to work with um, because they do. They really do want to be teachers back in China or back in Indonesia. Uh, but we also have domestic students and they have a very different agenda. For them, it is about professional development. It's about upskilling. It's about coming up, well, actually getting some kind of certification. But their needs are very different. And then we have primary, secondary, adult sector to deal with. So these, this is the co cohort that we're working with. And we're trying to come up with the course assessment tasks that really try and meet those different needs. And I think that's really important. So just to give you a little bit of history, the uh, mini lesson was uh, very much in favour during the 60s generally. It hasn't fallen out of favour in language teaching. It's still very much part of what we do and, and it's a 10 minute task that we ask all students to do. And then we provide them uh, with feedback and then that's then tied to the second part of the assessment which is a critical review of the lesson. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so how it fits, this is a Master of TESOL course. There are three units, language curriculum, uh, culture and curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, bilingualism and content-based programs, which constitute the core of the course. And then we have this particular unit, which is a pro professional practice for teachers of TESOL, and it is an optional unit. Um, so the idea is that students come in and they've had all the theory, they've been introduced to some of the practice. In this particular unit, it really is about the doing. So we actually get the students involved in sharing information, talking about teaching tips, and that's where um, the, the focus of the mini lesson then becomes really important. Get up there, do it, let's see what, you can, what you've actually developed in terms of the other three um, core units. Okay. So the task itself, as you can see, mini lesson, um, 10 minutes. We, we give them a 15, 15 minutes because it's a 10 minute teaching and then a five minute um, feedback, immediate feedback that we give them. As well as that, we ask students to uh, assess their peers. So there's peer assessment. We ask the students who are presenting to also assess themselves and this is done through the recording. We had some trouble with technology last year but we're going to be developing this idea much more this year and then feedback from the lecturer as well. And then um, they're given a written feedback and a 10 minute audio feedback. So it's quite a lot of feedback that they're presented with. And then we ask them, they've, they're given two weeks to think about and reflect on that feedback, use that feedback to write a 2,000 word second part, which is really the reflection. And here they're asked to bring together the theories of pedagogy as it connects to the teaching of English as a second language and the practice. So that's just in a nutshell what that particular uh, task is about. So it's quite a rich, multiple thronged, if you like, multiple perspectives that come into this particular assessment task and very time consuming. And <laughs> so what I've done here is just I think it's really important to look at what the faculty says about assessment. How do I link this assessment task to the faculty's assessment policy and what it says about quality feedback? Um, so this is what we do. In, in the red is what we actually do. We, we give them two completed rubrics with written comments on the students' work, one on the mini lesson and one on the reflective piece. We, give, we provide the oral comments from us, the lecturers, from peers um, immediately. 
and then we provide an audio file and then we also ask students to assess themselves. So the bits in blue aren't really in the uh, faculty's assessment policy. The notion that assessment goes beyond what we, the kind of feedback we give and that it really ought to also, particularly in this context I think, involve peers and involve themselves. And this is a difficult thing to do um, because we, I think we need to give the students the skills to be able to do this, particularly international students. Um, there's a lot of assumed knowledge that we've had to unpack as well. Okay. So I thought I might just come, bring together some of the unsolicited feedback that we've received based on this. And three of these, there are four, three of them were in the public domain. They're actually presented in the discussion forum on uh, our Moodle site. And here I've just highlighted in blue what I consider to be the key concepts in feedback. So it was a worthwhile exercise. The feedback allowed a lot of learning to take place and an opportunity to improve lesson delivery. So how do I fill in that gap? How can this help my learning? I also appreciate you taking the time to give us such thorough feedback. So both written and audio messages really complement each other and provides an opportunity to reflect on what we've done for the second part of the assignment. And I think in the case of the international students, the audio files are particularly important because we have another way in for them. They can listen to it, they can repeat it a number of times, they can unpack it in ways that giving them written uh, may not do. Uh, it changed the way I look into myself as a person, a teacher, and the way I look into my students. And then best to improve myself. I will keep doing my best to improve myself. I mean, very powerful feedback here. Right? This is the impact of really doing this kind of task. And then the idea of enforcing written feedback with oral feedback is an excellent one. Overall quality, it improves, it adds to the overall quality of the learning experience. And that also I think is important. But also a recognition that making the decision to invest more of your time than is required for us to learn. I think that was really, <laughs> that the students actually noticed that was wonderful. <laughs> okay, okay, nearly done. And so I've come to a list of questions as well. <laughs> I frame my questions a little bit differently because what I've done is I'm borrowing from the key concepts and principles in language testing and assessment, as well as the university's assessment policy to bring this together. So is it worthwhile? Um, the, the Monash uh, policy actually states that assessment tasks need to be purposeful. Uh, they need to address um, assessment for learning and assessment for demonstration. They need to be responsive and supportive of further learning. So that's one point. So to what extent does this particular assessment task meet that requirement? Need to be valid and reliable. And in this sense, they should be aligned with credible aligned with the content, um, the, con uh, the construct and content validity. So to what extent does it meet the actual outcomes of the course that we state? What our aims and purposes are? Should be consistent and reproducible. And here, this is, a, this is an issue for me. Well, one, to what extent can I ask my colleagues to give this kind of very, very intense, very time consuming assessment task? How do I maintain quality across that as well, particularly when there's an audio file as well as a written? And what do I do if that's not done in terms of the, the, the issue of reliability? Secondly, what happens with my online students who can't present in a face-to-face -face mode, but for whom teaching is to be conducted face-to-face? -face? And so there's a tension, and that's a really big issue. To what extent is the task authentic? How does it relate to real life um, in terms of teaching and preparing, preparation for teaching? Is it likely to have a positive washback effect and how do I judge that? This is a really important issue. This goes beyond what I do. Um, and do I need to go beyond the, the actual unit itself and the assessment task? So what washback, how can I gather that particular evidence becomes really important? And these last two, I think, are really critical and they're not really things that we think about, but the practicality of 
what I do. I, we've had to go beyond the 12 hours face to face in order to do this task. We just have to. We can't do it. With increasing numbers of students, we've gone from 24 to 30. We've got 55 this year. Three of us will be teaching it. But in any case, the 15 minutes of the actual task itself, then the audio, then the written, etc., really does become quite problematic in terms of practicality. And this is a really important issue in high stakes language testing. Sorry, can I just one more minute? Um, um, because the issue is how it has to be practical in terms of resources, it can't in terms of costs. Um, so, to what extent is this task practical? It's, is it worth? I think it is worthwhile doing, and the students certainly get a lot out of it. But to what extent does that, with the tension then, with, with the practical aspect, it becomes a, a huge issue for us, particularly if we're going to increase numbers. And that's really another tension, that the way that this unit has been developed and conceptualised is now a problem for us in terms of the numbers that are coming in, in terms of how it's being delivered. So face to face is okay if you've got a very small class and not big numbers of international students, but what happens when that changes? And, and that's attention, and that's something that we really need to work with. And finally, again, something that we don't think about, and that is the sense of fairness, the ethics of what we do, the notion of accountability. I am accountable to those students. Testing needs to, assessment and testing needs to be accountable, needs to be fair. How do I ensure that what I do, given the, the constraints are flexible. How, how can I ensure that those students are well prepared in order to be able to do well in this task becomes a huge issue and that's something that we need to think about. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Anna. So you framed it around tensions. Maybe just spend two minutes talking about are these tensions on your agendas? Are these things that you're struggling with and just share with each other? Maybe someone different or whoever's next to you for a couple of minutes now as well. All right, folks, I hope that that's given you a chance to have some kind of synergy or, or connection to your own practice and to the kinds of questions that you're thinking about in your work. And so finally, I'd like to ask my colleague Rachel Forgas to, to talk about her tale of anguish and reimagining. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so one of the questions Libby asked um, right at the beginning in relation to this broad topic was how do we know that our students are learning and so my presentation has the title documenting and assessing our students learning what learning <laughs> um, a tale of anguish and reimagining now for those of you who know me uh, you won't be surprised by the slightly dramatic tenor um, <laughs> of the title um, but it it really does feel like not an overstatement. Um, and so where we've had an arts-based presentation and a language-based presentation, I guess mine as a drama person, <laughs> yeah, it's a narrative, I guess I want to share a story. Um, I've always loved teaching. And so when I started working here seven years ago, um, I thought I'd landed my dream job and I told everyone I had because the idea of teaching about teaching, I couldn't think about, of anything uh, I would rather do. And so the anguish in my title is over the, my changing feelings about teaching and about my students over the time that I've been here. Um, and it's that anguish that has led to a reimagining um, of teaching and of learning and in particular of the nature of assessment. And I'll put it in a nutshell in case I run out of time, um, that that reimagining is of even summative assessment as learning and for learning because I'm not sure that we have any other place to do it. Um, so over the last few years, I've found myself having a lot of corridor conversations with people about how different students were back in the day, um, as opposed to now, where there are increasing pressures on us to provide more, more resources, more online communication, more scaffolding, more support, at the very same time as expectations that our students engage with any of this stuff are simultaneously on the decline. And it's this situation that's led to my anguish, feelings of frustration, disappointment, exhaustion, and ultimately I realised hurt. I was feeling really hurt by my students' minimum effort, maximum expectation attitudes. 
And the anguish really set in for me when I realised that I was starting to resent my students and I was actually starting to hate teaching. Um, so as well as this raft of really uncomfortable feelings that I was experiencing, I was simultaneously, um, my thinking about teaching was making less and less sense to me as some of my most basic assumptions about education were being fundamentally challenged. So as a teacher educator in this faculty, I have been teaching students that the definition of pedagogy is something to do with the relational space between teaching and learning. But in the current climate, this most basic assumption that there is a relationship between my teaching and their learning is thrown into question. Now, I understand in relation to the second point that students learn in community, that because of the magic of technology, students are engaged in all these wonderful global online communities, and that's great. But in the units that I design and teach, the local learning community of the unit itself is a fundamental aspect of the pedagogy. We teach each other and we learn from each other. And so in the absence of that commitment to being part of the local community, both the teaching and the learning of the unit are compromised. And this last point is the one that I suspect you're not really supposed to talk about. Um, or maybe even think about because all your focus is on your students. But for me, uh, this was the point that really made a difference. When I realised that I had to question whether I actually enjoyed teaching anymore, um, that was the thing that really mattered. And I couldn't, I couldn't live with it, you know, it was the unbearable situation. And so I started to ask myself, how can I get my joy back? Um, and, and that meant that I, I had to really reflect quite deeply on what it was that I felt like I'd lost. What was it about teaching that I loved that I'd lost? And it came down to three things for me. And they're all connected. The first is presence. And it's not necessarily physical presence, but also increasingly temporal presence. So sharing time together. Um, because that in the absence of presence, um, dialogue wasn't possible. And I started to feel that in these flexible units that I was teaching in, where students were posting a response to a prompt that I'd set them, but there was a very loud full stop at the end of their rant. And it was really clear that they were not interested in engaging in dialogue about what they had shared. Um, and community is the last one. And I think I didn't really appreciate how vital community was to my love of teaching until I was teaching in a unit. Um, it had been taught in flexible mode, but I'd always had a really great experience because the same group of students came, the same group of students engaged synchronously online and the same group of students engaged asynchronously. So there was this kind of stable community. And then there was this one year where, and I'm not lying, every single week, it was a different combination of students who rocked up to class. And so there was no continuity, there was no familiarity, there's no sense of trust, and I felt like I was re-experiencing every week of the semester, that awful first class of the semester, where you're engaging with a bunch of strangers. So then my questions became, how can I create presence, dialogue and community in this current climate and within the faculty attendance requirements that clearly prohibit me from mandating attendance. Mm. So I first experimented with how to do this um, in 2014 in one of my drama education classes. Um, uh, and I designed a new assessment task after I had a, a really mortifying experience in 2013. And that was, I had a student, um, you'll know him, Renee, who couldn't possibly come to the first three weeks in the semester because he was already engaged. And then in week four, he was out in schools on placement. Um, mm. And so um, in 2014, I responded um, in my drama ed class by developing this assessment task where um, sorry, students had to post five times to a discussion forum reflections on a minimum of five experiences that they had had in class. <laughs> so they had, could actually only complete the task if they had been to class a minimum of five times in the semester. And it worked really well. Yeah, you are allowed to do it. I asked the Associate Dean Education. And in fact, 
In fact, the assessment policy suggests to us that we should, because the second half of that statement is that academic staff are encouraged to ensure unit assessment types and due dates encourage student attendance. It's what the science faculty have been doing for years in assessing labs. So in 2015, it had worked so well that I added another layer. And this was that I added the assessment of five pre-class tasks in which students had to engage with a weekly <coughs> reading and a weekly video, and then they had to post a dialogical analysis of one in relation to the other. So I've got presence and I've got dialogue. They posted these responses to a Q&A forum, which means they can't see others' responses until they've posted their own. But eventually all their responses to the reading went public. And so this meant that their individual and accessible work was also contributing to the collaborative learning of the whole group as a community, whether they came to class or not. And here's what really interested me. In the SETU data, student nom students nominated these tasks as the best things about the unit because they forced me to engage with the course and the readings. And this feedback really helped me to see that our students are just doing what they've always done. They're taking their cues from us about what is the bare minimum. I used to do it. What's 80% of 15 weeks? How many weeks do I not have to go? <laughs> And it seems to me that despite the fact that many of them can only do the bare minimum, like many of us, many of them ultimately want more. They want deeper engagement with us and with each other, but they can only afford to give it if it's part of what's measured, because that's what counts. Yep. So, um, so I started to think about how I could apply this even to units with larger enrolments. So in semester two of 2015, in expertise in teaching, a flexible master's unit that I co-taught with Sarah Rutherford to 65 students between two of us, um, I drew on everything that I had learned, um, but we tightened things up because we knew we had to with 65 students. So they engaged in one hour of preparation online where they engaged in like a pop cultural text that introduced the key ideas of the week. Then they engaged in one hour of participation, either face to face or online, but the focus of that hour was their participation with each other, talking about the ideas in more scholarly terms. And those scholarly ideas were then picked up in a weekly reading that Sarah and I set for them after the class. Each week for eight weeks, students read the article and then had to draw on their thinking from the preparation, the participation and the reading to participate in their final one hour of, of contact, which was a reflective task. Again, they posted it online and were able to see each other's responses to the readings. The tasks combined to make up a 2,000 word assessment task. It was kind of like a rolling annotated bibliography that they engaged with over the course of the semester. And once again, the students loved it. They loved, there were weekly components and expectations for participation. That meant, there it is again, I had to remain on top of my studies and engage with the unit on a weekly basis. So what, is all of this, what does all of this matter you know, in the age of evidence? Well, for me, the point is that I now have in both of these unit, units evidence in those weekly posts it's data, it's evidence of their learning in relation to the standards, blah, blah. But the main thing for me is it's evidence that they are learning again. So what are the implications of this? I want to just emphasise this is not supposed to be a tale of what everyone should do in order to, you know, survive and thrive the age of evidence at all. It's just a story about what I learned about asking myself these two questions. Am I enjoying teaching? And actually, are my students learning anything? And my answer to both of those questions was starting to be no. And so instead of blaming my students for the answer being no, I started to allow myself to imagine that like me, they actually wanted the answers to be yes. But for that to happen, I had to reimagine teaching. 
I had to reimagine learning and I had to reimagine assessment in acknowledgement of the way that things are now. And that meant interrogating my assumptions and adapting my practices so that I could capitalise on the idea of even summative assessment as learning. And in doing that, I have really started to come back from the anguish and be able to tentatively say yes. So like Anna and like Helen, I end with a couple of questions. And I started to think, imagine if our unit and cat meetings began with these questions. And if these were the questions that we used as drivers for evaluation and development of our courses in the programs. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, we won't go into small groups now. We've got just two or three, or well, just two minutes, I think. Has anybody Sorry. got one comment or one or two comments or questions you would like to put to any of the panel members or just comments that are coming into your head after engaging in this seminar? For me, the best part is that there's more food for thought. So I'm going to take away more questions and more thinking about my practice. Great. I think I like that the panel each member shared very personal stories and honest ones. I know you could just see the nods around the room that people were engaging with those. Mm. Mm. A lot of tensions that we share in, this, in these mm -hmm. times in lots of ways, in things that are imposed on us, sometimes not in the way that we would like our work to unfold. Mm. And we sometimes wish that it, we hark back to what we sometimes call the good old days. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we're hearing that with the use of Moodle and technology and, and online learning, there can be very creative ways forward in what we do. Any other comments? Yes. Yeah, I really appreciate each one of you. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, just uh, share my thoughts after listening to Rachel's one. Um, I think the, uh, the line that I got from your presentation was, uh, whether we can love students. In order to love them, we need to change. I think your journey tells us that important thing. They are variously, uh, in, in a various manner, showing the kind of the challenge. Can you love me still, even though I do this, I do that, <laughs> or I don't do this? Can you love me? And you are saying, yes, I can. I love them. Thank you. Thank you. Any last comments? Yes, Brendan. Uh, yes, so we had a few people online. They've all really enjoyed your presentation. <laughs> And um, Kate De Bruyne had a question for um, Rachel. Um, she was very interested in how you went about the assessment of what you set up. Um, yeah, do you, can you explain a little bit more about it? I can. I also want to say, like, this is what happens. You know, it's interesting when we share the ways that we're addressing these. Um, dilemmas, um, people often want to know, well, how did you do it? And is it allowed? And um, what about the word counts and whatever else? And I really wanted to, I, I really, I think we all did made a point today of really wanting to share the deep thinking and the, um, um, the feeling that drives what we do. So um, what I can say is it's legit, it's above board, it's been checked out with the ADE, it's gone through, you know, it's, in, it's, um, it's all above board. So if people want to see the tasks and learn more about the assessment, I'm really happy to share those. Um, but rather than to sort of devolve into the nitty gritty, um, I thought we might just, yeah, save a little bit more space for... Talk. Well, probably time. We're supposed to finish before the hour to allow people to move. Thank you very much, as always, to Chris for being here for the technology, to Brendan for doing the work and setting all of this up, to Rachel, who really led a lot of conversations amongst all of us. And this is the first of two parts, mm -hmm. and uh, others in the academic community will contribute more. I'm not sure what the next date is for it. I'm August, August 31st, in, I feel in, in, like. in August. Right um, but they're great conversation chances uh, as starters, and they're an opportunity for us to think about this, this complex work and tension rife work that we do. In, and as you say, to sit down and make a time to talk to our colleagues more deeply about these things. Thank you for coming. We look forward to further conversations with you. Mm -hmm.